Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Pasha. Yeah, it's complex, uh, complex Russian name, and its original form is uh, Pavel. You shouldn't care about this stuff. Anyways, you will uh, forget me in, I believe, 51 minutes, and that's fine. I will forget you too. <laughs> no, I won't ever forget you. You know, you know, I wanted to visit Luxembourg for many, many years. It's my first chance, so I'm just happy to be here. Thank you for the warm welcome. And yeah, as I said before the talk, I'm not here to sell Kotlin to you. I'm here to talk about, like, I suppose that you can read Kotlin. Who can read Kotlin? Who can write Kotlin? Two hands. Uh, we should jump now, I believe. Just, you know, after the lunch, it, it might be useful or maybe not. And yeah. Uh, I'm developer advocate at uh, JetBrains. So you can see this Kotlin logo at the very bottom of the slide. It's because I'm developer advocate for Kotlin. Again, it's not the topic of the talk. Um, I'm da. I am like 10 years with JVM, maybe a little bit more, mostly in Java and Kotlin, but also if you will dig into some private repositories, I hope you don't have an access to them. You will find some closure code and some Scala code. So I kind of tried several things in JVM, but I prefer Kotlin. I, and yeah, my whole development life, I was a backend developer. So I use Spring because, you know, Spring is a main thing you use on backend. Of course, we have this fancy KTOR framework. I don't know, Helidon, Quarkus, Micronode, but Enterprise made a choice. And we can see that the market share of Spring is growing. The market share of Java E is going down. And actually, Kotlin is not playing too well, but you can, you can make it work with Java E if it's your thing. If you will decide to say, to say something bad to me, you can find me on Twitter, or if you hate Elon Musk, you can find me in Mastodon too. But yeah, this talk is about what I learned in last years of usage, Kotlin with Spring. I will talk about some very basic uh, applica example application. It's kind of non-service. The world talks about monoliths, microservices, and so on. This is non-service. It, will, it has one function, I don't know. It, it can do cr CRUD, create, read, update, delete in the database. Of course, it has MVC in itself, and uh, it has some validation because, well, you should validate the data. Of course, it uses GPA. Well, because it's in an industry standard, right? Who uses GPA? Who uses GPA with Kotlin? Who likes it? Okay, one hand and mine. I like it because I know how to do it. You will know too, hopefully. Sometimes, sometimes it try, it falls back, falls back to JDBC. <coughs> and to say any good service, it should be tested at least somehow. Well, hopefully. I hope that you write tests. Do not, do not raise your hand, hands if you don't. How do I create my projects? Uh, that's very simple. I go to start.spring.io. I say that I want to use Gradle with Kotlin. Do you know that Kotlin is now the main language of Gradle and Groovy is kind of deprecated? Well, not main language, not deprecated at all. And of course, we generate the project with Kotlin and Spring Boot. I use the latest version and ju just to be sure that anything won't work or something won't work at least. Uh, that's uh, dependencies I add to my thing. And as a result of clicking this generate button on started Spring I.O., I get only two files generated actually. Well, many folders and two files. First file is called build Gradle KTS and the second one is Co Spring Kotlin start Spring Kotlin start application. That's a good thing I won't need to read it. Gradle, build Gradle KTS is very long. I have 100 something lines, and we definitely won't read it today. Well, I mean, reading aloud is nice, but probably not for this audience. So let's talk a bit for the main class generated. The main class generated looks like this. It has a nice Spring Boot application. Of course, you all know this notation, and it sits on the class Spring Kotlin Start application. And also we have a main method, 
in, inside which we do something weird. We say run application, this triangle brackets, spring code and start application, then pass our arguments in there. What is this run application? It's actually the first goodie we hit when we generate the project, uh, Kotlin goodie for Spring. It's actually an inline function that accepts arguments. Inline means that it will be inline, right? Right. And what it does internally, it calls spring application.run, and it's what we usually do in Java. Spring application.run, and the, then our spring Java application something dot class and pass the, our, our arguments there. And the Kotlin signature is just a little bit, little bit more nice. And yeah, I won't spend any more time on it because let's start implementing our stuff, right? I always start with uh, controllers. For me, it's just easier to think an API, how customer will communicate with my application. So I create with, with a very basic controller it's request maps to slash person, and it has post mapping. And you can see that nothing is interesting here. It's what we do in Java, right? And also I have this function create person that has request body and valid annotations on, on an argument. Who knows what the valid annotation is? Okay, the valid annotation checks that the person, in our case, or argument, will pass all the necessary validation. And I'm talking about JSR 303 validations, those annotations with uh, valida annotations that denote our validation rules. And also, I have a very simple person class. It's data class. Data class is just a class that allows to copy, and it doesn't have any getter setters, just two properties, name and age. Name is string, age is int. Probably somewhere in this presentation, you will see that I use age as double. You shouldn't care about it. It's just a small mistake I made. So let's check how our validation works and make a simple post request to our slash person. And it will be empty. Like we will denote our content type declare our container type application JSON and would, won't put anybody in there. And that's what we get. That's an error we should get. It's 400 bad request. Well, because because person is not non-nullable, non we, di we didn't see this question mark after the type declaration, so it should fail. And that's that's actually nice, but how how it works? Well, it is about one part of the generated build Gradle KTS. It says that on tasks with type Kotlin compile, we have this free compiler argument that we should use a JSR 305 equals strict. And if you look at what XJSR 305 is, it's a notation for software defect detection. It says that there should be such a notation as, I don't know, not null, check not null, no, not NLS, not NLS, uh, and NLS, and so on. Just annotations that allow us to create some validation given this meta information. So, yeah. So it should work. Okay, now let's try to post an empty properties. How do you think, who thinks that it will fail? Nice. Half of the audience thinks that it, it will fail. And that's true, bad request, it's how it should be. And we have this uh, error on, the, on our backend that we don't have some value for JSON property. Okay, okay, let's continue testing our small nano service and put the name Pasha and still will set age as null. Who thinks that it will cause an error? Why are you so smart? You are not supposed to, I mean, I should be smart, smart person here, right? <laughs> sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to, to offend anybody. It actually passes. Well, I mean, what? Did you see this talk called what? Yeah, love it. L let's look into our data class again. Name is string and is it is not nullable. 
and h well here it is double it should be int but it's double anyways it's not nullable how the hell it works again well i mean do you remember this meme thing is in jvm there is such thing as a primitive type and we have several int char double float boolean something else and they have default values in JVM. And it means that in compiled Kotlin, yeah, by the way, I have a list, apparently, of them all. So in compiled Kotlin, when we have a, null, not, a non nullable primitive type, it's being compiled to Java primitive from this list. And this way, it has a default value. For example, for int, it's zero, for uh, double it's double zero or uh, dot zero for boolean it's false and so on well for all of them it's zero but for boolean it's false because false is kind of zero too how can we avoid it well like this we can add this notation on field not null and mark the double nullable it's not very nice but hopefully it will do the job Let's check again, passing age null. Yeah, okay, 400 bad requests. It's how it should be. And we have this descriptive, very descriptive error, hooray. That's cool. Actually, there is another way around. Since it's the thing about Jackson serialization, we can work around it by Jackson settings and say that Spring Jackson serialization fail on non null, fail, fail on null, null pre, for primitives true. A little bit hard to remember. Idea will help to have to complete it for you, but you should still remember and you should still care because we have these primitive types all over the application, not only in our MVC controllers, we have them in, I don't know, services. And Jackson has nothing in common with the services. That's the important part. So let's quickly summarize this section. First of all, uh, free compiler argument xjsr305 equals strict will make the validation easier. We, will, we won't need to put additional and not null annotations on our types. For JVM primitives types, we have to put field not null and mark them nullable. And sometimes we can work around with JSON settings. And here we go to the next important part of every application. When we have our MVC controller defined, we can slowly move to JPA. And since we have nano service, we also have nano entity. It's almost like our data class person. It's entity cl data class person. It has ID with generation uh, generated value ID. It has, by the way, yeah, it has val name and val age in the separate columns. It doesn't have no argument constructor. Who thinks it will work? No? Well, okay, nobody thinks it will work. Okay, it won't work. Why? Because, because by definition, entities should have no arg constructors at the very least. Let's try to improve it, at least. First of all, data classes have this copy equals hash code. Again, copy. Well, it has multiple copies, actually, in compiled bytecode. So I'm kind of honest there. And component X defined. And we definitely don't need them in our entities. We won't be able to use them in our entities. So let's just remove data keyword from here. Now, we have this val name and val age, but thing is JPA won't be able to write in, in, in them because JPA uses getters and setters and not fields. So yeah, we should improve it in a bit, a bit too. We just change them to var, var name and var age. But still, still, there is no, no R constructor and we can actually create it easily. We don't need to create it in our code. We can just use a piece of magic. Well, 
whole string is magic. So you won't be against using one more piece of magic, right? We can add Kotlin JPA plugin. I didn't update the Kotlin version here. Sorry, of course, it should be 1.8.21. Anyways, it will put all the annotations we saw, like column, ID, and so on, on the fields, because currently they are on the constructor arguments. And also, it adds a default constructor in bytecode. You should understand that it's basically impossible to create a default constructor for such a class in Kotlin, in source code, because we have non-nullable fields and we cannot assign anything sensible to these fields. So what this plugin does, it just creates an empty constructor that does nothing and all these fields are nulls, which is not beautiful, but it makes the, it makes the job. So current result is looks something like this. We have class person with, and it, it should work. Is this enough? Uh, not quite. At the very least, we have to redefine equals and hash code. Thing is, for equals and hash code, there is no good way to generate them for GPA. And well, GPA won't work correctly without correctly uh, correctly written hash code and equals. For example, your lists of entities will behave incorrectly. Probably GPA, Hibernate, or whatever you use, will delete on update of the list. Hibernate will, will probably delete everything from database and then insert a huge band, bunch of same but different entities in there, which is kind of usually what we don't want. Yeah, and the simplest implementation of hash code is something like this. It should return ID, or if ID is not defined, it should return no, zero. And then all our collections will compare things by equals, and it kind of should work. But again, it's a complicated task. Uh, Vlad Michalcha wrote about it, and many other people wrote about correct definition of equals and hash code. You're welcome to read. It's definitely not a topic of my talk because it's not in any way connected to Kotlin, it's, um, it's about JPA and its shortcomings or longcomings, de depending on your view. Sometimes we have to fall back to JDBC, <laughs> definitely not in this case. I will still talk about this case because if we have issues even with this case, well, we have big problems with more complex cases. Here is how we work with JDBC template in Spring in Java. Let's say we want to find a list of persons, but I, I don't know why it is a list. It's not important. Of course, it should be a single person. We have this call gdbc template.query. Then we have our query in plain text. And then we have now our new user role mapper. And then we have our ID. It's a little bit counterintuitive. We will, we will talk about it a little bit later. User row mapper is an implementation of row mapper that can create a person from, with help of map row method that can take from result set, I don't know, int ID, string name, double H, and then compose a whole person and return it back to the initial query. I don't like this mapper, so let's try to inline it. Because otherwise we will have a lot of mappers all of our, all, all of our code. They will, f functions using them and mappers themselves will be spread. By the way, my charger for some reason doesn't work. Well, let's hope that it will last enough. Um, yeah, it's basically the same code. Now we have this lambda that accepts result set and i. We don't need this i, by the way. It's a row number and we won't use it. Still, well, that's how we will use it. Result set get in, get string, and so on. And then we will pass our user ID, which is kind of ugly. Why do we pass our arguments of our query as parts, not as parts of our, well, not after the query? It would be nice to have them right after the query and before the mapper. 
that too far away and if the query is big and we probably have tens of parameters, it's, it's what we have in enterprise, it will be really hard to read and interpolate inside your brains. Well, let's look at the signature of this query. It accepts string, SQL, row mapper, and then varark of objects arguments, nullable. Because in Java, you cannot define varark's argument in between other arguments. It should be the last argument, otherwise it won't work. In Kotlin, it's actually not the case. This is how the same query looks in Kotlin. GDBC template query, then our query, and then our user ID, and then our mapper. And by the way, I don't need this I, I don't need this row number, I don't use it anyways. So I can replace it with underscore, which is much more readable in my opinion. And var var variable arguments should, don't have to be in the last position. I'm not selling JDBC or Kotlin here to you. It's important thing to understand when you write your own code or you improve on top of some jo existing Java code. Sometimes it makes sense to move variable arguments in the middle of the lists of arguments. And this way, it will be a little bit more beautiful. It works with help of extension functions. We have extension functions of, on GD, we have Spring Framework has extension function query on GDPC operations specifically for Kotlin that has var arg var variable arguments as a, as a second argument and function as a third argument. And yeah all this stuff, and it allows us, and the fact that it accepts function as the last argument, allows us to put the mapper itself outside of parentheses, like this. And, sorry for this. I don't know what happened to my slide. They have many ex um, extensions for Spring. For Spring Beans, Spring Context, Spring Core, GDBC Messaging Card, to GDBC Art Text, TX, Test, Web, Web Flux, Web, and WebMVC. So both for reactive stuff and for classical, let's say, stuff. And you should be able to use it. Now, when we have the core of our application, let's talk a bit about configuration. Because configuration is important and configuration is an essential part of every at least enterprise applications. In our pet projects, we can hard code something, but wait. In enterprise, first thing we usually do is just to create a Jackson object mapper because it should be configured in a special way to support Kotlin data classes, for example. Look at this nice DSL. DSL stands for domain specific language. And in this case, we have domain specific language to define how our application is gonna, uh, which beans our application has. And it's done in a very nice way. We have this beans call and inside we have bean. The insi inside this bean, we can create anything we want. Like in this, in this case, it can be Jackson object mapper with the reasons, Kotlin mapper or anything else. It's just a modified Jackson object mapper. And it's actually, in Java, it was actually four lines instead of one. Look how beautiful it is. And let's say sometimes we need some custom bin because, well, we have them, some custom logics that doesn't fit into service because, well, it's a little bit separate. Probably it handles connections to some other servers, probably it's some HTTP client or something. In my case, it's just a JSON logger. And it, this is a very simplistic example. I just wanted to write some random code to demonstrate it. Look, so I have this class JSON logger and I want it to be a bin and I want it to depend on the object mapper, which is actually a JSON, J JSON object mapper. And I have some simplistic logics like if this is a data class, I want to use it, uh, I want to log it as JSON that can be provided by J JSON object mapper. Otherwise, I can just print it as a string. How will I pass it? Well, here is how I can create a bin. 
Look how beautiful it is. I don't even need to instantiate this class. I just give a reference to the JSON logger constructor to the bin, and in, uh, it understands itself that JSON logger depends on object mapper. And this way, it knows, because it already has JSON object mapper, it now can create a JSON logger and put it into, inside our context, and we can use it later in our application after the configuration. And also, we can have any arbitrary logic, because in Java, when we define, so, oh, of course, Spring Boot provides us with, uh, if not exists, annotations and so on, but, well, it's usually not enough. Sometimes we want to have some loops or some, something. And, well, let's say we want to have a bean called with name, uh, random good thing, and we don't know if we want to have it lazy initialized or not, so we can provide like an online for here, is lazy init equals random next boolean. Well, don't do it in your production application. You should probably know if it should be lazy or not, but we can redefine it. How awesome is it? And also, we can redefine the bin itself. Well, we, we can put just if here, if random next boolean, then it's Norway, so otherwise it's, well, who cares? Anything. And how do I use it? Well, let's, I mean, it, this custom configuration. Let's return to our very first file. We had this line in there. La run application, sample, applica uh, sample application arcs. And we have this val beans, defined beans somewhere. Probably it's visible to the whole application because why not? It's just handy. The simplest way to, initiate, to add this configuration to our application is to add a lambda after our run application and put add initializers in there. Who knew about add initializers? Cool. Only one person knows about add initializers. Folks, you can modify your runtime easily with add initializers. You can say Spring, hey, I have a bunch of additional configurations for you. Use it. And that's that simple. Let's start it. Well, application starts, and it means that, how much did it take? One second? Nice. My applications with Hibernate usually start like 20 seconds. Well, it's a, it means that our context is complete and it works. Now let's write a simple test for it. I, get, I will define one more bin. I will uh, annotate it with component. I will call it my bin. It will uh, depend on JSON logger, not important. And also I will write a usual test. You all know how to write tests, uh, Spring Boot test and so on. Spring Boot test just in case creates a test that brings up the whole Spring context and you can run something inside it. Um, I, after wire my bin that I just declared here for the testing purposes. And now I tested it. I, I, I just wanna be sure that my logger logs test as test. I run this test and wow, uh, that's an error. It doesn't fight just on logger. Why? Who knows why? I like that you don't know. That's because tests do not call main, and we had, have this add initializers call inside our main, and <laughs> tests do not know anything about it, so we have to fix it somehow. How do we fix it? Well, we have this beans defined, and now Spring has this concept called beans um, <laughs> application context initializer, and we can create a class with it, we will call it beans initializer because our variable is named beans. And we should overwrite only one function called initialize. It accepts a context as an argument. And now we, ca we, ca we can say beans.initialize context. Beans is already an instance of our 
bins configuration and it can initialize the context. Basically the same thing we did in our main file. Now Spring should somehow find this file so we can put this context.initializer.classes uh, and fqdn of our class into our application YAML or properties or whatever you want and Spring will be aware of it. And now in main KT we return back to our initial form, we just run application without any lambdas around it. It's simple again. And that works. I don't have any summary for this thing, but just remember that there is such a thing as bins DSL configuration. And you can use it and it's very fa fancy. It's much more beautiful, at least in my opinion, than what we have with annotations and so on. But then, then the security comes and we should think about security, right? At least for some time, sometimes. And this is how we'll configure, uh, configure our security. You can see the same bins again. We can define security configuration obviously inside our bins declaration. We will define a new bin, but now it's a little bit more tricky. Do you see this line? ref.http security. It's the way to say Spring, hey, find me a bin of type HTTP security or create it for me inside the bin DSL. And it is called HTTP. And when, I, when you see this line, it's actually we are operating on this particular instance of HTTP security. And inside it, we can define stuff. For example, we can disable CSRF this way. Don't do it. Disabling CSRF is a bad thing. You should probably enable it everywhere. And if you don't know what CSRF is, please read because it's important in terms of web security and so on. But look how beautiful it is. Usual security configuration is this huge chain of calls. And I cannot remember what I should call after what, and if it's important or not. In DSL, I can just define things. We are talking about HTTP security, so yeah, let's enable HTTP basic. And let's say that everything in our application sh should be matched with security, like everything should be secured. No nobody without the proper access rights should be able to access it. And yeah, we can authorize requests. And again, it's a small piece of DSL, domain, domain, domain specific language for security. And that says that for slash auth, we can, I don't know, we can uh, only, uh, slash auth is allowed only for authenticated users and uh, everything else is allowed for everything. And then we called HTTP build. Actually, we can put dot build after the closing bracket. It's just not too very beautiful, but it's a matter of taste. Just do it as you like. And look how nice this DSL likes, uh, lies in a, inside the bin configuration DSL. You cannot even distinguish where is the border between these DSLs. Okay, yeah, you actually can. HTTP opens with this, and this is the border of security configuration. But it's just beautiful. It's, it doesn't feel alien as another way to configure the HTTP security. So, what did I learn? First of all, yeah, always generate projects with start.spring.io. It's just, well, it just has all the latest versions of stuff and they're probably compatible and everything is tuned fine. For example, JPA support is already enabled. Reify generics can make an API better sometimes and it's a nice, uh, we can see a nice example with our main function, but you can use them in your own code too. In every place where you use something dot class equals, probably you should use, I don't know, Verified generics. Validation is much better with Kotlin. 
I mean, it was the main selling point of Kotlin all the time, right? That no null pointer exceptions. That's true. But remember about primitives and ca please care about primitives. If something will be compiled to Java primitive, we should probably work things around. Data classes should not be used with JPA. Why should not be, they be used? Because first of all, they don't have a default constructor. They don't have, a, by default at least, they have uh, equals, they have hash code defined incorrectly. They have component.x and copy methods that we don't need at all. Please just use usual classes and redefine equals and hash code in the correct way working for your application. JDBC is just simpler. I mean, simpler to read, simpler to write. Nothing spreads around your code. Your mappers are right there. If you want, you can put them in functions. If you don't want, you don't have to put them in functions. You can use in place lambdas, and that's perfectly fine. No runtime overhead there. Bin definition DSL is, I would say, the most underrated thing in the whole Kotlin Spring integration. Nobody knows about it. It's described in the Spring framework documentation. It's not described in the Spring, inside Spring Boot documentation. That's why people don't use it, but it's actually much more beautiful. And some say it's faster. If you have any measurements, please tell me because I don't. And it's hard to measure how much time does it take to configure your application. And with security, it's even better. Well, I'm not speaking about general security. Security in your application. Spring security. Thank you very much. Um, that's basically time for questions. If you are too shy to ask them right now, please find me at my Twitter or Instagram. I'm Asmodee almost everywhere. I'm <laughs> accidentally Asmodee at Twitter because, well, Asmodee was busy. Questions? Thank you. Yep. Um, say it again, please. Uh, some pointer you showed, uh, bits initializing. Yep. Uh, you didn't change the delegates. So I'm not doing the delegate question, but I'm I think, oh, thank you. I, so I will repeat your question. No, okay. okay. So I, I'm not a delegate specialist, but I think it's a use case for that. Am I wrong? Uh, okay, uh, question was the following. I showed the bins initializer, but I didn't show the delegates. Uh, and are they, are they the case? Is there the case to use the Kotlin delegates for bins initialization? It's a hard question. I would say no because, well, first of all, theoretically you can. Second of all, what, and it's important, Spring has its own way to provide a ready bin inside the bin's de definition, like ref.http security, and oh, triangle, triangle brackets, uh, HTTP security, probably they have a reason to do so, and I would propose not to reinvent the wheel. However, if you feel that in your case, delegation works better, just do it. I mean, Kotlin is a powerful language because you have many ways to achieve your goal. Thank you for the question. Did I answer it? Yeah. Awesome. More questions? We have plenty of time, 12 minutes. Everybody's shy. Maybe a question. Yeah. So um, we have seen that uh, with uh, Spring Boot 3.1, yep. um, and especially with uh, Spring Security, the uh, end uh, method has been deprecated. You know, we have a lot in in Spring, in Spring Boot Java, in Spring with Spring Security, we define security with HTTP dot authorized request and uh, session something and mm -hmm. uh, cookie. And we see that uh, with a Spring uh, Spring Boot three dot one, the end method has been deprecated in favor of the Lambda uh, declaration for security. So if we switch back to the slide you had previously on Spring Security, I think the method end is never is never used yes 
so nothing is duplicated here. The DSL doesn't change. I wouldn't say that it's a selling point because, well, there is just no good reason to change it. DSL is very simple and I believe much more readable than the previous way of, well, the Java way of configuration. So it seems, yeah, yeah the, the Kotlin way is now the, the, the way promoted by the Spring Security? Is it something we may say? <laughs> I don't know if it's officially promoted, uh, so I can say yes, even though I really want to say yes, people to, VMware sells our product. Uh, however, uh, we can say, since this is official thing, it's a part of Spring ecosystem, it's developed by, by VMware, I would say that in Kotlin, you are encouraged to use this DSL and not the Java one. It's created for a reason. It's easier to read and actually easier to write too. Did I answer the question? Thank you very much for that. More questions? Okay then. Ah, uh, yeah, question there. Hello. Hello. Um, so you talked about um, GPA and GDBC. Yep. Um, did you ever try a uh, Juke with Kotlin? Yes. And what do you think about? Yes, I <laughs> didn't put it into this presentation. First of all, I did. I wasn't sure that I will fit in time with Juke. But yeah, we see that I do. Last time I did this presentation, it took like fifteen minutes more. Um, Juke is awesome. Juke is awesome by itself, and it's even better with Kotlin. Lucas Eder is just an amazing developer. He added a special module to for extended uh, uh, Kotlin support into Juke. Uh, so it now suppo supports coroutines and many other stuff. But in the very core Juke, Kotlin already gives you some benefits. For example, there is such notation like uh, result.get and then uh, name of my field. Result.get, I don't know, name, for example. In Kotlin, it will look a different way. It will look like result, square brackets, name. Just shorter and you still understand what's going on. And you see, you can see this small changes all over the place and I like it very much. And also some, uh, there are some operators overloaded and you can use them. For example, comparison of columns uh, just looks better in Kotlin than in Java. And there are no shortcomings, it just works. You don't, you don't, wait, there was something, one sh short, small quirk, but yeah, right. There is a way to define alias in Juke called dot s something as something another. And in Kotlin, s is a keyword, so you can, you should put s in a backticks. This way it will be called correctly. And this is the only thing, negative thing I can remember from the top of my head. Overall, I massively recommend to use Juke. I stopped using JDBC many years ago when I discovered Juke and my companies pay, even paid for Juke, for the enterprise editions of Juke. Thank you for the question, it's amazing. More questions? Okay, I feel that I have to let you go. Thank you very much for your attention.